Right now, this agency is engaged in a broad range of activities. We're tracking the effects of climate change. We're measuring it very precisely. And we are actively making that data and knowledge available around the world. A few weeks ago, I announced NASA is exploring a new concept. We're going to set up a mission control center for climate change. And it's going to be accessible not only to those in the room, but to folks that want to dial in virtually. NASA uses a mission control center for every launch and mission. And in the case of the International Space Station, it has a mission control that's 24-7, 365. And that's been going on for two and a half decades. And no less effort should be made to restore Mother Nature's environmental balance. This is not a mission that we can undertake alone, however. It requires a lot of collaboration. It requires uh, reaching out to commercial companies, our international partners as well. Our decisions are going to determine the fate of this planet. So let's act boldly and with urgency. Let's protect it, not only for this generation, but let's preserve it for the generations that will follow for years and years. Hello everyone and welcome to the Hello. U.S. Center and our event today which is going to be Climate Science Leading the Way. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Marshall Shepard of the University of Georgia. Hello, Hello. and good, and good evening, evening, Glasgow. My name is Marshall Shepard, and I will be moderating this session. I am the Georgia Athletic Association Distinguished Professor of Atmospheric Sciences and Geography at the University of Georgia. I'm also a former president of the American Meteorological Society and was recently inducted into the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. You'll be hearing more about my written discussion a bit later. First, I want to welcome you to this session entitled Climate Science Leading the Way as the final contribution to day one of the U.S. Center at COP26. You will be hearing from a group of U.S. experts on many different scientific perspectives on climate science. Our goal today is to provide you with an overview of where we are and where we are going in our quest to understand and project the Earth's system and therefore inform actions as the world responds to the climate crisis. Fittingly, I'm proud to introduce our first speaker, Jane Lubchenco. Jane is the Deputy Director for Climate and the Environment in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. She comes to the White House from the University of Oregon, where she is the University Distinguished Professor. Jane is a longtime champion of science, working to strengthen the engagement of scientists with society and find durable solutions to environmental challenges. In the Obama administration, she served as Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmospheres and the Administrator of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I'm pleased to present my friend and colleague, Jane Lipchenko. Welcome welcome welcome, 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 welcome to the U.S. US Pavilion, Pavilion at the 26th Conference of the Parties here in Glasgow and around the world. Thank you, Marshall, for that very nice introduction. And thank you all for joining us. I'm delighted to help open COP26. Huge thanks to our organizers, the people of Glasgow, and to the negotiators for all that they are doing to make the meeting successful. I love the title of our session today, Climate Science Leading the Way. We see on a daily basis how scientific discovery and technology enrich our lives. For example, allowing me to how it's changing and why. 
and science helps us work together to resolve social crises like the current COVID-19 pandemic, providing life-saving vaccines, medicines, and health care. And to our point today, science is key to effective climate action, <clears throat> key to slashing greenhouse gas emissions, and key to preparing our communities for current and future threats. Science from the latest IPCC report underscores the urgent need for climate action, and it bolsters the US administration's bold commitments to address climate change. Here in the US, we are listening to science and to scientists. The president is committed to science-based decision-making. He has restored science in the federal government policy development by relying on the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Moreover, for the first time in history, the president elevated the position of his science advisor to a cabinet level position, ensuring that science is at the table. Because the US government is listening to the science, we understand that there is an increasingly narrow pathway to achieving our collective climate goals. We know therefore that this is the critical decade for action. And that's exactly why the US is bringing bold commitments to COP26, commitments to both avoid the most catastrophic impacts of climate change and commitments to protect our communities. In addition, the US will continue to be a force for scientific innovation and a powerhouse of scientific discovery. We embrace this challenge. I couldn't be more excited about our speaker lineup today. We have brilliant, insightful people who are at the forefront of knowledge and are gifted communicators. They share a passion for science in service of society. These scientists will give us a glimpse into what the past climate tells us about the future, what current impacts look like on the ground today, and what the levels of future warming will be under different levels of emissions. They can tell us what those impacts mean to people and how to communicate risks and develop a climate literate society. And of course, they will focus on what should be done to tackle climate change, prepare our communities, and protect our nation. I'm also excited because these experts come from diverse places around the United States. The US is a big place, and each region is experiencing somewhat different climate threats. For example, Dr. Ravello and Dr. Preston are from the Western part of the US, which is being increasingly affected by large wildfires that destroy homes, cause school closures and hospitalizations due to bad air quality and affect the water supply. A water supply that has been threatened by the reduced snowpack in the Sierra Nevada mountains. That very smoke from Western wildfires has been transported all the way across the country to the Northeast where Dr. Marvel lives. And her New York City faces another threat from rising seas with about 13 inches of sea level rise since 1880, more than the global rise of eight inches. That <clears throat> coupled with increased precipitation is inundating the iconic subway tunnels, damaging homes, and the electrical grid and overwhelming sewage treatment plants. Further north, Dr. Dumpigny Giro is facing more precipitation and more floods, which impacts tourism and farming, fishing and forestry. Warmer winters and earlier springs threaten fruit crops, maple syrup production and the ecosystems that drive the resource-based industries of the Northeast. Dr. Shepard lives in the Southeast where more heat waves and loss of soil moisture mean more droughts in their future, more extreme heat waves that have the potential to harm children and older adults and result in major losses in labor hours. 
Now you might think that Dr. Romero Lencao, who lives in the central Western US, is in a safer place than these coastal experts who are all facing increases in sea level rise and intensity of hurricanes. But her region's residents are facing increases in both drought and floods, wildfires and reduced snowpack, and increase in vector-borne diseases and effects on agricultural water supplies. So across the country, we see impacts. And these experts are here today to share their knowledge and their insights into the risks associated with climate change and the opportunities we have to address this crisis. We are all here today because we are excited by the promise of Glasgow to see the world coming together to solve the climate crisis. I am proud that the US is in the forefront of bold science-based ambition. And we are thrilled to set the tone with these scientists. Thank you all for joining me and this great lineup of experts from around our country to hear about how science is leading the way to addressing the existential threat of climate change. Thank you so much, Jane, for those inspiring remarks. And we know that knowledge is critical and necessary, but its value is only measured by how well we communicate it. Now, I'm a scientist, but I also engage more broadly with the public. And so now I'd like to deliver to you a few remarks on how we engage and communicate climate science in a way that resonates with people that necessarily are not scientists. Hello, I'm Dr. Marshall Shepard and I'm the Georgia Athletic Association's Distinguished Professor of Geography and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Georgia. And I'm also the Director of the Atmospheric Sciences Program at that institution. I'm a US-based climate scientist, but I'm also something else. I'm a father and an inhabitant of planet Earth. And we are facing one of the most significant challenges in the history of humanity the climate crisis. And I'm here to talk today from the perspective of a scientist, a communicator, and a father. Because when people ask me, well, Dr. Shepard, what if you all are wrong as scientists about climate change? What if you've missed something? I look at them dead in the eye and I say, I hope you're right. Because if I'm right, my kids lose. But unfortunately, the data and the peer-reviewed literature and what I see around me on planet Earth suggests that we're not wrong. Our climate is changing and it is impacting every aspect of our lives through changes to weather, changes in the economy, agriculture, national security, public health, infrastructure vulnerability, and so much more. And so it's important as academics, as scientists, as professors, as leaders, to move beyond our comfort zones and ivory towers and engage and so that's why I'm so excited about COP26. Nations around the world are engaging. We have everyone at the table addressing climate change. We have a goal of net zero by mid-century and doing it in an equitable way while unleashing the power of the developed nation's financial powerhouses and economies. Institutions are coming to the table, governments, leaders, and thinking about these challenges from their lens, but also from countries that may be more at risk or vulnerable. And this equity lens is quite important. So as we move forward as scientists and stakeholders at COP26, I'd like to think about how we communicate aspects of climate change and our solutions and our approach going forward. You know, in the days leading up, I asked my wife, do you know what COP26 is? And she said, no, she's a really intelligent person, but she isn't as attentive to this as I am as a climate scientist. We have to change that because just like everyone is aware now of a pandemic and COVID-19, climate change 
will impact their lives in similar ways and perhaps over longer periods of time. So here are some tips for communicating climate change and the solution space going forward. First, we have to know our audience. When we talk to audiences, we have to connect to a value system. We have to understand what is important to that audience at, that, at the time. They're less concerned with our trend lines and our graphs and our sensitivity studies and the things that we talk about in climate parlance. They want to know about kitchen table issues. When I sit down tonight with my family for dinner, we, we discuss things that are important to us around that table. And there are families all across this planet that do the same thing. They think about where their next meal is coming from. Can they afford it? They think about the infrastructure around them and their health, the health of their children, security, and the economy. Those are kitchen table issues, water, energy. These are the things that resonate, not polar bears or the year 2080, all of which are very important, by the way. But people are here and now. Everything is local. And so we have to articulate our messaging in a way that resonates. Secondly, I mentioned this point earlier. The entire world is coming together. And I think people need to understand that. COP26 through the United Nations and all of its partners are establishing and actionalizing a framework for getting us to net zero by mid-century. Everyone's at the table. And we are glad to be at the table as well. And thirdly, when we communicate and think about climate change, we must understand that everyone's exposed to the hazards, whether it's sea level rise, strong hurricanes, drought, floods, heat waves. But there are still those within our communities and countries that are disproportionately impacted. And so there has to be a discussion and a narrative and a communication strategy uh, for those people as well. And in some cases, we have to be engaged with those communities and nations and co-produce the solutions. Uh, many of us have thoughts and ideas, and those will be on the table at COP26, I'm sure. But I hope and I think that the world will also consider co-producing and thinking about this together. And so that's why I'm so excited that COP26 is happening. I hope there's significant progress towards the goals laid out. And then we can move to a space where everyone on this planet understands, no matter where you're from, that there's no plan B planet. This is our home. And we are challenged and obligated for our children's sake, if nothing else, to get through this crisis together. Thank you. Well, I guess I should thank myself but that was a critical message and I was uh, delighted to deliver it. We're now going to dive into how climate science considers the past, present and future. We have three US experts who are going to provide insights from each of these three perspectives. We will begin with thoughts on how we use the past to understand current and future climate conditions from Christina Ravello. Christina is a professor of ocean sciences at the University of California at Santa Cruz where she uses stable isotope geochemistry to learn about conditions of the oceans and climates of millions of years ago. She received her bachelor's degree in geology and anthropology from Stanford and a master's degree in her PhD in geology from Columbia. Christina was, a, was named a fellow of the American Geophysical Union in 2012. And now, Christina. Hello. My name is Christina Ravello, and I am speaking to you from the University of California, Santa Cruz in the United States. I'm here to talk about how studies of past climate change are used to project future global warming. Past climate change, or paleoclimatology, is studied using geological archives of oceanic and climate conditions. Examples of these geological archives are corals, tree rings, ice cores, and lake and ocean sediments. At first glance, it may seem that the geological past is not relevant to future predictions of climate. But in fact, paleoclimatology provides incredibly important and invaluable information critical for predicting the future. 
I'll point out two ways in which paleoclimate information is crucial. First, as you know, future climate projections are primarily used using computer model simulations. But how do we know that our models are reliable? Verifying the reliability of models and even improvements to models are possible because of paleoclimate data. If models can simulate past periods of warmth accurately, then we have confidence that these same models can provide reliable climate proje projections under increasingly high greenhouse gas levels in the future. The second way that paleoclimate information is used is to predict future climate change through giving us insight into the equilibrium climate state. Or in other words, it gives us information about what climate change we have already committed to once our climate system equilibrates to higher CO2 levels in the future. Allow me to provide an example from a past period of global warmth called the Pliocene. The Pliocene occurred about three to five million years ago. It was the last time in Earth's history when carbon dioxide concentrations were the same as today for a sustained period of time. Pliocene carbon dioxide concentrations were around 400 to 450 ppm. Thus, the Pliocene is a geological epoch that provides, one, data that we can use to test how well climate models perform when forced with increasing concentrations of CO2, and two, data that we can use to predict the magnitude of climate change we have already committed ourselves to. What does paleoclimate data from the Pliocene tell us? Okay, the Pliocene was about two and a half degrees Celsius warmer than today. This is consistent with model predictions of global warming we have already committed to, and the magnitude of warming will increase as we continue to emit greenhouse gases. In the Pliocene, sea level was most likely about 20 meters or 65 feet higher than today. What does this imply? It means that the majority of the Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheets were gone, and even the East Antarctic ice sheet was likely reduced in size. We know that sea level rise has a delayed response to climate change. The Pliocene tells us that we have potentially already committed to melting a volume of ice that will lead to 65 feet of sea level rise. Again, remember that the Pliocene greenhouse gas concentrations were the same as today. And if the Pliocene presents an accurate picture of sea level change, we have committed ourselves to a world where eventually all of our coastlines will be different and all of our coastal cities will be flooded. Getting back to temperatures, I have already told you that the Pliocene was two and a half degrees warmer than today on average. But what does that look like in specific regions? The Pliocene had amplified warming at higher latitudes also consistent with model projections of the future. Oceanic regions like the North Atlantic and the Arctic were three to five degrees warmer. And on land, instead of tundra with permafrost, the permafrost was thawed and there were de deciduous forests instead. There were also large changes in some of our most biologically productive regions of the ocean which are the cold coastal currents, such as the California current, the Peru-Chile current, and the Benguela current off of West Africa. These regions were up to eight degrees warmer than today. The Pliocene also had a permanent El Nino-like climate state. Thus, many of the climate impacts that we see during El Nino events were a permanent feature of the Pliocene. This includes permanent drying of an Indonesia and Australia and wetter and warmer conditions in much of the Americas. I hope that I have painted a picture for you of the Pliocene warm period that you can stick in your minds. And remember that CO2 during the Pliocene was the same as it is today. So the Pliocene tells us that we have already committed to a very different climate state compared to today. Next, we must ask ourselves, how well do the climate models perform when we try to simulate Pliocene climate? Well, over the last few decades, climate models have gotten so good that they do an exceptional job of simulating almost 
all aspects of what we know about the Pliocene. Thus, Pliocene data model comparisons provide crucial confirmation of many aspects of future climate projections. But there is room for improvement and a lot more that we'd like to know. For example, on the modeling side, the resolution of the models is too coarse to accurately simulate narrow coastal currents. On the data side, there are large areas of the ocean and land for which we don't yet have Pliocene data, and thus it is hard to validate model projections in all regions. I hope that I have given you a taste of the power and importance of paleoclimatology. In addition to the Pliocene warm period, there are many other examples of how studies of the past are essential for validating climate models and future climate projections. I thank you for listening. Thank you, Christina. Moving from the past to the present, we will hear next from Leslie Ann Dupinier Giraud, a good friend and colleague of mine. Leslie Ann is a professor at the University of Vermont and is also the Vermont State Climatologist and current president of the American Association of State Climatologists. Her work focuses on applied climatology and in particular various aspects of drought. She received her bachelor's degree in physical geography from the University of Toronto and her master's and PhD in climatology and GIS from McGill University. Let's hear from Leslie Ann. Greetings. My name is Leslie Ann Dupini Giroux and I am a professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Vermont and the president of the American Association of State Climatologists. When I think about the centrality of observations in looking at uh, the climate record and looking at how we can observe how climate have ch has changed in the past and continues to change presently, one of the pieces that it's, is critically important for us is to see how these observations show us, uh, for example, that the rates of change that we thought were going to occur are actually occurring faster than they were projected to occur. Some of the other pieces that are important about having a very long term record is that it allows us to see um, changes in variability um, and what that means for uh, vulnerability for us as human beings, for us as um, a socio society from, from a socio ecological perspective. It also helps us to improve our models by having long term high quality records to be able to, to validate those models and also to be able to have a better sense of some of the things that we um, didn't have as well in the past. For example, the ability to look at, at climate change in cities, the ability to better factor in teleconnections, for example, in North Atlantic Oscillation, in Nino Southern Oscillation for example. So the ability to have these longer term records allows us to, to both constantly improve, validate and, in, and look at, at, at future climate changes. Now, the, the other piece about having long term records is that it allows us to, to actually be able to um, quantify the non-stationarity in the climate record. And so as we have um, new observations of what the magnitude of observed events are, that helps us to, to create um, better forecasts, better projections, better sizing from an infrastructure perspective, and so be able to adapt to climate change in ways that we may not have been able to if those long term high quality records were not in place. Now, the other part about uh, about having long term records is that there's some new and exciting technologies coming online, and those include, for example, uh, various types of geospatial technologies like LIDAR, but also having different platforms, for example, um, artificial intelligence and the ways in which we can perform exploratory analyses using these machine learning and deep learning techniques that we didn't necessarily have access to in the past. So having these large volumes of, of data and being able to manipulate them and to, to learn and to see what the, the new patterns that are emerging are, are critically important. The other piece that's important to us in, in looking at, at our present climate 
um, chain signal is also to make sure that we're doing this from a systems perspective. And systems include not just our physical systems, so our air, our water, our land, um, our biosphere, the vegetation, but also from a, a human perspective. So we're looking at all of these systems from a, a sort of coupled human socio-ecological perspective, and that allows us to get a sense of how we as human beings are either um, affecting our, our natural environment and being affected by our natural environment. And it's critically important that we do this systems-based approach so that we can factor in things like all of the various types of natural hazards that are at play, whether it's wildfires or droughts or floods or changes in, in air quality and the ways in which, um, again, these affect us as human beings. Now, when we think about this and we think about all the processes that are occurring, it's important to keep in mind that they're occurring across multiple temporal and spatial scales and, and the way in which these play out, again, from um, a continuum from local perspectives all the way up to our, our global perspectives. And part of this sort of, of systems approach also has us to think about all of the, the greenhouse gases that are part of the, the drivers for, for, for present day climate change and, and the ways in which the um, types of gases, their longevity in the, the atmosphere, their global warming potential, their sources, and the ones that um, have a particular um, impact in terms of the strength of, of the warming, for example, methane, and, and the ways in which um, methane sources, be it uh, permafrost melting, but also the, the sort of overlap with, with other aspects like wildfires or things that we need to sort of keep in mind. And as we're looking at this and thinking about it, um, it's, it's also helpful to remember that science is iterative. And so as we collect more information, as we collect more observations, as we learn more about the system, as we bring all of these pieces together in our ever improving models, our ever improving processes and dynamics, this helps us to see um, some of the changes that are occurring in ways that we may not necessarily have observed in the past. And it, it also helps us to, to, to better quantify um, things that, that may not have been as, as crystal clear um, 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And so it's really exciting to see the advances in attribution and the ways in which we can actually um, detect that climate change signal in, in, in the way in which it sort of amplifies a lot of processes, including natural hazards that we are actually observing. So as we think about it and we think about all of this from a systems perspective, it helps us to, to sort of also keep in mind um, we as human beings and our vulnerability, whether it is a vulnerability, vulnerability from a human perspective, um, vulnerability to make sure that we um, do no harm to the environment, do no harm to, to us as, as human beings, um, whether we can think about vulnerability from a geographic perspective, from a locational perspective, but also from um, a socioeconomic perspective. And so factoring in all of these ways of, of looking at the, the impacts and responses to climate change are, are critically important. And so when we bring all of these data and data sets and information and understanding together in one place, the, the next piece then becomes how do we share that and how do we use our privilege as scientists to make sure that everybody has access to the information in a way that is um, true, in a way that honors all ways of knowing, in a way that um, uses the best visualizations, in a way that allows everybody to be able to be at the table and to bring their expertise, their knowledge, but also to learn as well. And so it's it's a, a co-equal environment in, in how do we use things like citizen science, for example, to, to help us advance our knowledge. And so when, when we think about um, all of these pieces together and, and, and using lenses like vulnerability and inclusion, it just helps us to make sure that we are um, acquiring our information, processing it, um, being aware of these various changes, being aware of, of some of the things that we consider to be surprises in the system, but also then making sure that everybody has access to the information in a way that will help them to make the decisions that they need to as we move forward with learning and understanding about our changing climate. Thank you, Leslie Ann. And we recognize that we are currently 
seeing the effects of climate change in many aspects of our lives. The critical questions have to do with the future and what our world will look like and how we do the work to minimize that change and prepare for the changes that we can't avoid. Kate Marvel will talk about climate change and the future. Kate is a research scientist at Columbia University and NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies. She uses paleoclimate records and modern observations through climate models to study climate change. Kate received her bachelor's degree from the University of California at Berkeley with majors in physics and astronomy, and she received her PhD in theoretical physics from the University of Cambridge. And now Kate Marvel. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here. My name is Kate Marvel, and I'm a climate scientist at Columbia University and NASA. The climate models that I study, which you can see here in yellow, tend to do a pretty good job of capturing the warming that we've seen so far, which you can see shown here in blue. But if you fast forward to the future, it's a different story. This is the output of different climate models run with the same future emission scenario. They all warm, but some of them warm more than others. And this points to a fundamental question. How hot will it get? And honestly, we don't know. This uncertainty falls into three basic categories, internal variability, model uncertainty, and scenario uncertainty. So let's start with internal variability the inherent randomness in the climate system. On short timescales, a natural event like an El Nino really matters. El Nino years tend to be warmer than normal years, and La Nina years are colder. But it's not just El Nino. Something else is going on, something more than just natural climate variability. That something is human activities. We know that natural factors like changes in the Earth's orbit, fluctuations in the solar output, or large volcanic eruptions can and, and have changed the climate before. But human activities are responsible for all of the observed long-term warming trend, actually a little bit more than all of it. Without us, the Earth would likely be cooling slightly. But there is some uncertainty in how the Earth will react to further increases in greenhouse gases. And this is because we've never done this experiment before. There is a lot we still don't understand about how the Earth responds when it's disturbed this much. Now, it's important to understand a little of the terminology here. So I'd like to talk about three things. The possibility of a runaway greenhouse effect, destabilizing positive feedback loops, and tipping points. So here's some good news. Will we experience a runaway greenhouse effect where our emissions lead to a doom loop, the oceans boil, and the Earth turns into Venus? The answer is probably not. There's not a lot of evidence for this in the paleoclimate record. Now, what about feedback loops, where warming causes changes to some aspect of the climate, which then feeds back on the warming? An example is ice albedo feedback. Ice is shiny. It reflects a lot of sunlight back into space. You make it warmer, you melt the ice, you expose darker ground or water below, and that in turn makes it warmer. This is happening right now, and it's a fairly well understood process. But not all feedback processes are that certain. Cloud changes are the least well understood climate feedback, and state of the art climate models are currently projecting potentially large destabilizing cloud feedbacks and very high climate sensitivities to doubled atmospheric carbon dioxide. Now, a new assessment on which I worked has narrowed the uncertainties in these feedbacks. We find that these high values projected by some climate models are pretty unlikely in light of the evidence. But the flip side is true too. Low values due to natural stabilizing feedbacks, those negative feedbacks we might expect would save us, are also highly unlikely. In fact, even more unlikely than those very high values. We find that climate sensitivity to double carbon dioxide is likely between 2.6 and 3.9 degrees Celsius. Finally, the concept of feedbacks often gets confused with tipping points, thresholds at which irreversible changes are triggered. 
things like the dieback of the Amazon rainforest or shifts in monsoons or the disintegration of the West Antarctic or Greenland ice sheets. Now, we do not know with any certainty when these tipping points will be reached. Every ton of emissions we avoid keeps us away from that unknown cliff edge. And finally, scenario uncertainty. What will we as humans choose to do? Because after all, we understand the problem. We know exactly what is causing the earth to heat up. Global temperatures are rising because atmospheric carbon dioxide is rising and other greenhouse gases due to human activities. And this means that how much global temperatures will rise in the future will depend on future emissions. It is still possible to stabilize global temperatures. It is also possible to see increases in global temperatures comparable to the difference between the last ice age and today. There is uncertainty in the physical system, it's true, but the biggest wild card is us. The future is largely in our hands. So to conclude, humans are causing all of the observed warming, and there is no safe level of warming where we can guarantee we will not be close to tipping points. It is not possible to avoid climate change. It is already here. And regardless of what we do, some adaptation to a changed climate will be necessary. But I want to stress that the science says it is very possible to avoid the worst case scenario. Our research in climate sensitivity means that action is necessary. Nature is not going to save us from warming. But it also means action matters. If climate sensitivity were extremely high, we'd have no chance. But it's not, and we do. And finally, the biggest wild card, the biggest source of uncertainty, is not an aspect of the physical climate system, and it's not internal variability. It's us, as humans. So the biggest wild card is what we're going to do. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Kate. And I think you reaffirmed something that is a theme emerging. Climate change is here. It's, it's now, and it's a crisis. Now, you've heard a lot about how the physical climate system uh, is changing, yet we know that human activity is changing the climate and that change climate impacts human activity. Patti romero Lenkow will talk about the human dimensions of climate change. Patti comes to us from the Department of Energy's Natural Renewable Energy Laboratory, where she works as a senior research scientist. Her research focuses on the crucial intersections among energy and the water systems, mobility, and the built environment in cities around the world. Patti received her bachelor's and master's degree from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. She holds two PhDs, one in Rural Sociology and Environment from the University of Bonn, and one in Sociology from the Autonomous Metropolitan University. I'll now turn over the floor to Patti. The invite to join this event. Uh, my name is Patti romero Lancao, and I want to tell you why is it that I think it is so important to have social scientists collaborating with modelers and with engineers and trying to understand how is it that we can move our societies away from their current carbon intensive trajectory. And I will provide you two examples of this. I know we all know that uh, we have amazing forecasts that allow us to understand and to predict where a hurricane will hit and what communities it will affect. This is the first, having accurate forecasts is fundamental, but it is not enough to help communities be able to respond to the hurricanes and to protect themselves and their property. For that, we also need to understand, A, how is it that communities uh, perceive and respond to those forecasts, what is what they do to, to protect themselves, and what factors such as cultural values or uh, prevent them from uh, protecting themselves and going to uh, shelters. So for this, the understanding is, of this is something that only social scientists 
can provide. Um, I have another example. Currently, we are working in the National Renewable Energy Lab, where I am a re senior researcher. We are working together with engineers. The engineers are developing a technology such as uh, solar panels, electric vehicles, resilient grids. This is a key effort. This is a key element of our efforts to transition our societies away from a carbon intensive a modes of a production, consumption, use of energy, and also mobility. That said, this effort is not enough. We also need to understand what factors determine populations' uh, interest, awareness, uh, preparedness to adopt these technologies. And those are societal and cultural factors. We know from our research that some users, such as uh, uh, educated users, wealthy users, are more likely to use these technologies to adopt them. They have the resources to do so. A key challenge for us at this point uh, is to develop strategies that allow us to support communities, disadvantaged communities, communities that don't have the assets and options to uh, adopt these technologies. We need to support them, uh, subsidize them, give them incentives to also adopt these technologies. And for that, we need social scientists. In short, I, 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 I know there is a lot I can say, but I hope I can convey to you that now more than ever, it is increasingly clear to practitioners, scholars, and decision makers that the climate crisis is not only a crisis that requires good science, good engineers, but it is a crisis that requires that social scientists help us understand what cultural barriers, what societal barriers and what economic barriers need to be overcome to move our populations away from their current ways of living, producing, uh, moving from one place to the other. Only when we bring different communities, uh, different disciplines to bear on this challenge, and only when we connect these, these tools and these methods with the knowledge and the insights from stakeholders will be uh, will we be able to move the needle and to embrace the challenge that the challenges that climate change poses to society. I want to thank you for allowing me to be part of this, and uh, I hope you have a very good uh, time in this amazing. A conference of the parties. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Patty. And absolutely, uh, at the end of the day, the climate is changing, but humans on the planet will be impacted. And so the human dimensions absolutely have to be there. Finally, we ask ourselves, how will humanity address climate change? Our standard response is that we will seek to avoid the changes that we can't manage through mitigation and we will manage the changes that we can't avoid through adaptation. Ben Preston brings perspective on both of these avenues. Ben is a senior policy researcher at the RAND Corporation and director of community health and environmental policy. He is also a professor at Pardee RAND Graduate School. Ben works to understand the role of knowledge and climate risk management and scenario analysis for a low carbon future. Ben received his bachelor's degree in biology from the College of William and Mary and a PhD in environmental biology from the Georgia Institute of Technology. And now Ben. Hello everyone and welcome to COP26. My name is Benjamin Preston and I'm a senior policy researcher at the RAND Corporation. As you've heard from others, innovations in science and technology are now giving us unprecedented capabilities in global change research that are expanding our understanding of the dynamics and complexity of climate change, as well as the role of human activities in driving that change. That knowledge is valuable, not only for building fundamental understanding of our world and advancing the global change research enterprise, 
but also for giving us the tools we need to respond to climate change, and in particular, achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement of limiting warming to below 2 degrees Celsius, if not 1.5 degrees. While continuing to build our understanding of the fundamental science of climate change is important, the world is now engaged not only in questions of science, but also questions of policy. What do we do? When do we do it? And how do we manage the benefits and trade-offs of our actions? That is why the eyes of the world are now on Glasgow and COP26, as leaders endeavor to build momentum for climate actions that are both commensurate with the risk, as well as their own stated ambitions. At a fundamental level, what's needed in terms of responses to climate change has been the same for many years. Specifically, the world needs to aggressively reduce its emissions of greenhouse gases, and this includes scaling up existing renewable energy technologies, such as wind and solar, divesting in legacy fossil energy assets, electrifying buildings, transportation, and industry, and continuing to develop carbon dioxide removal technologies and techniques. The good news is we've made progress on all these fronts. In the United States, for example, the use of coal has declined markedly over the past decade, and the majority of new electricity generation capacity is now for renewables. Solar energy has emerged as one of the more inexpensive forms of electricity generation, and our worst case emission scenarios from a decade ago now seem overly pessimistic, and this is all largely due to interventions we've made in energy systems. Nevertheless, we have to do more. As demonstrated by the UNEP's recent emissions gap report, substantial effort, additional effort, is needed and quickly to manage climate risk and to ensure everyone has access to clean development pathways. At the same time, we cannot forget that many people around the world, even in wealthy countries such as the United States, are already facing the adverse effects of climate change. Moreover, those impacts are not born equally. Low-income populations, communities of color, and marginalized groups often bear the first and most severe impacts of climate change, often due to result of pre-existing vulnerabilities and inequities. Therefore, we need to continue to pursue adaptation options as a means of reducing current climate risk, as well as the escalating risk to both humans and natural ecosystems that we're anticipating in the decades ahead. But here too, we've seen progress. This includes adaptation planning from local to national scales, as well as the implement implementation of projects and programs to reduce risk from climate change and disasters. For example, in the United States, 26 different federal agencies recently completed the publication of climate adaptation plans, and efforts are also underway to expand climate services to support decision-making by stakeholders around the country. Significant investments are being made in protecting coastal infrastructure from rising sea levels, enhancing water supply security, reducing urban heat islands, enhancing the capacity of natural ecosystems to adapt. And as implementation of these strategies evolves, the Biden administration is prioritizing investments in environmental justice communities as a means of addressing historical inequities. Meanwhile, we're seeing climate risk increasingly be incorporated into financial markets, which is catalyzing the private sector to engage in climate risk management and innovate in terms of solutions. Nevertheless, just as with greenhouse gas mitigation, significant additional efforts are needed to support adaptation efforts in both the United States and internationally, particularly in developing nations where resilience to climate change has to be integrated into the sustainable development agenda. The international community has pledged to enhance assistance for developing nations on the order of $100 billion per year, while also supporting the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction through 2030. But delivering on these objectives will necessitate not just the mobilization of capital, but also the mobilization of knowledge, including technology transfer and the sharing of best practices around what works. So to that end, as all these efforts move ahead, I believe it's critically important that we have the capabilities needed to monitor progress and evaluate performance. For example, we need to be able to observe transitions in energy, agricultural, and infrastructure systems, as well as changes in human and ecological well-being. This generates the evidence we need to understand which options and interventions work and which are ineffective or even maladaptive. So thanks for listening and thanks for all you're doing to address the climate challenge. I hope you'll join me in working toward a successful COP26. Thanks. Thank you, Ben, wow. I hope that you will join me in thanking all of our speakers 
That's really been a whirlwind tour through many of the scientific issues that make up climate science. We recognize that science does and will underpin the world's recognition of and response to climate change and the crisis. We are pleased to be here today in the important venue representing the United States scientific community. My best wishes to the global community and to the participants at COP. The world is counting on you. Good evening.